Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 104, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, first of all, we want to say, obviously, welcome again if you are a regular listener, week in, week out to the Retro Hour podcast, or maybe one of our quite substantial number of new listeners recently. I did spot we were number three in the overall iTunes chart the other day. Yeah, we got a nice little boost thanks to a little article in the uh, Guardian uh, or Weekend Observer. Yeah, that was last Sunday. That was actually a nice surprise because, I mean, I actually read the radio column in the Guardian quite a bit you know, I, I do work in the, the radio industry during the day. And, uh, you know, this is very well respected. Uh, Miranda Sawyer's section in there. We actually got a mention in there alongside Radio 4. And it's quite good, you know, because she doesn't really play that many games, but she said she found the show really interesting, so hopefully you guys will as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you are new to the show after checking out that article, welcome on board. Great to have you listening. And the way the show works is uh, Ravi and I run through the stories that have been making the headlines in the world of retro gaming this week because, I mean, that's something that still blows people's minds, that there is fresh new news about retro gaming. And there is a lot that's always coming out. You know, we can't fit it in now every week. And then in the second half of the show, we welcome on a very special guest. Now, this week, um, we've actually got someone who's going to be joining us on our massive YouTuber panel that's coming up next month at Play Expo in Blackpool. Because, you know, we've hosted Play. This will be, what, our third or fourth time now that we've hosted Play? Yeah, and it's it's, it's, it's a huge event, like... You can't talk about the scale of this. I think it's uh, 20 or 30,000. It's just massive. It is a huge event. And, like, you know, there's one in Manchester that we do. We do the one in Blackpool as well. I think, you know, the two events are very different, but Blackpool is always so much fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at the seaside. It's <laughs> yeah. always fun. And this is its seventh year. And lots going on this year as well. Now, we're going to be hosting the talk stage again there. We have a DMA design panel. Oh gosh, that's that's going to be amazing anyway, because DMA Designs, think about the games that they did. They did Lemmings and then Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Hired Guns, um, yeah. obviously one of my favourites. Well, Steve Hammond is going to be there joining us on stage. Maybe a few more surprises to be announced as well. Uh, the Oliver Twins are going to be there. Obviously, at the moment, they're working really hard on their new game that's going to be coming out on the Spectrum next. Now, um, if you don't know what the Spectrum Next is, it's the next Spectrum, you know. It's kind of like the, de- the the development of the Spectrum has been continued. And this is like one of the most hyped retro projects of the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, having a recreation of the Spectrum. And obviously the, the Oliver Twins, the guys behind the Dizzy games back in the day, mm. uh, you do not get much bigger than Dizzy if no. you're talking Spectrum <laughs> games. Digitizer, Mr. Biffo's going to be there as well. He used to use Digitizer on uh, Teletext back in the day. Oh, yeah, that, that was massive. It was also a bit risque as well, wasn't it? <laughs> He's got some great stories as well, Paul Rose. And uh, this is actually a first, I think, in UK retro shows. We're going to be doing a YouTuber panel. Now, we're going to have, essentially, some of our favourite YouTubers from the UK that we've had on the show before. I'm so excited to actually meet them in the flesh. Yeah, it's nuts, because, you know, we, we communicate with them, we have them on the show, we talk to them. But actually, at these events, one of the good things is being able to meet up face-to-face. And obviously, Blackpool, you know, it's essential to get like a, a 90 pence pint at the bar. <laughs> yeah, and, and we always see these YouTuber panels in kind of massive American events and stuff, and they're never at the UK, so... Well, Larry Bundy's going to be there, our Guru Larry, Nostalgia Nerd, Kim Justice, and our special guest on this week's show, Daniel Ibbotson, Slopes Game Room. Now, he's got quite an interesting history, actually. I mean, first of all, he's a massive Sega fanboy. Oh, yeah, and his videos are unbelievably researched. Like, if you want to look at someone who researches video game history amazingly, he's your man. You know, once his videos are done, it's complete. That's the complete history. Yeah. I mean, he's telling us he takes, like, sometimes two months to do, like, you know, research his videos really in-depth. And he was also a TV presenter as well, wasn't he, for a while? He's got a bit of history there. The UK version of Jackass, essentially. So, (laughs) going to be a really interesting one. Slopes Game Room, Daniel Ibbotson, is going to be our special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, you might be hearing all this thinking, I'd love to come to that event. It sounds loads of fun. We always look after our listeners, don't we? Oh, yes. We always get you in the best shows. So do you want to come along and be Ravi and I's special guests for Play Expo Blackpool? Now, we're giving away, we've got a few weekend passes to give away, so this will entitle you and a friend to come along on both days, on uh, Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of February. It's happening at, wait, it's Norbert Castle, isn't it, the the venue? Yeah. Uh, The Nork Olympia Exhibition Centre in Blackpool. And, I mean, you you just walk in this place. There's, like, wall-to-wall arcades, retro gaming traders are there as well. All the games are free to play, pinball machines and... I'm kind of annoyed that we're going to be hosting, not (laughs) running around and uh, playing with the games. Well, we're bringing, uh, you know, obviously our mate, 
Wright's uh, Joe and Alex are coming, so they always look out for bargains for us, don't they, nice and early. So if you'd like to come along and win a pair of weekend passes to be there for free, you can be our special guests. Uh, we've got a little form that we're going to leave open for two weeks on the front page of the retrohour.com. All you've got to do is nip on there, uh, leave your details. We're going to close this on Friday the 26th of January at midnight. Uh, pop your details in there and then we'll pick out a few winners at random. We'll drop you an email back and uh, hopefully sort you out with a couple of free passes to come along. Good thing about it is as well, actually, it's a good event to bring the family to as well because it is, I mean, people have been saying it's out of season for Blackpool. thing about that is, though, obviously it means less queues to yeah. get into things. Every, everywhere's still open. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, all, all the attractions are open. And actually, if you do want to bring the family along, they're actually giving out uh, two-for-one tickets for Merlin Attractions at Play Expo. So this will save you a lot of money if you're bringing the kids along. Yeah, the yeah Merlin Attractions, that's like Blackpool Tower, isn't it? Yeah, the Madame Tussauds. Sea Life Centre. Yeah, stuff Blackpool like. Eye, the Dungeons as well. Yeah, yeah. So make a weekend of it as well. So they're giving those out at Play Expo. And if you'd like to enter that competition uh, and book tickets as well, all of those links you can find on the front page of our website, The Retro Hour. Dot com. Hopefully we'll see you there. Speaking of events, we've got a pretty busy <laughs> couple of weeks, haven't we? Oh God, Next I... weekend we're doing an event as well. Yeah, I've got to practice my DJing. I'm supposed to DJ there and I haven't used these decks for like a year. So... Your mixer blew up the other day, didn't it? Oh yeah, my mixer's blown up. Dan's got his in the boot that I'm going to have to practice with this week. So uh, yeah, it's interesting. This is all your base, which is happening like kind of multiple venues. They're going to do stuff at Theatre Royal which was fantastic. I went to see Dear Esther live in Birmingham. It is a proper theatre, isn't it? A proper uh, yeah. old school theatre. Very old. Big theatre, and they're going to have Dear Esther played with Jess Curry doing the music of it. And, you know, there's a massive programme as well. So there's loads going on. There's a, there's a ticketed programme and a public programme as well. So even if you can't afford the ticket, can't come along, there's still events coming on. And, you know, there's just going to be some absolutely fantastic people there. There's uh, my... Oh, I could never say his name. The go guy, on, have a go. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you to, you're going to be on my stage Saya with him. Matsuda. That's you, it. I hope you're going to rehearse that before you actually introduce him on stage. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sitting there for ages and then I'll say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Hubbard. Yeah, the Rob Hubbard. Commodore 64 oh, legend. Kenny McAlpine as well. They've They've got a lot more... DJ Ravi Abbott. Never heard of him. No, <laughs> no. no. That, that puts me off going, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, David Wise, who did Donkey Kong Country soundtrack. So really, just come down to this event and have a good laugh. Yeah, we're going to be down there. Uh, it's happening all weekend, like you said, the Friday and the Saturday next yeah. week as well. So we'll put ticket information for that um, in our calendar at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into this week's stories, we have to say a massive, massive thank you to the people who allow us to keep coming in and doing this show week in, week out. And that is people who make a little donation into the running of the Retro Hour podcast. And just for doing that, any amount, big or small, you'll earn your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Well, you may notice that the website's a bit faster at the moment, and that's thanks to you wonderful donators. Yeah, because we've uh, moved away from <coughs> Domain.com, who we had uh, a fair few problems with. We're on uh, Bluehost now? Yeah, Bluehost, oh, and yeah. it's uh, fantastic. But five times faster now, yeah. so <laughs> that should help as well. So all you got to do is nip onto the website, theretrohour.com. We have PayPal on there, um, pretty much every cryptocurrency we accept on there too and this week we want to say a massive thank you to chad golding john barrick william darren fox johannes tollyjanda who all made donations into the running of the retro hour podcast and you can do the same at the retro hour.com right before slopes game room should we do a few stories oh yeah we've got some great ones this week and should we start with a bit of nintendo news well this is an official nintendo so isn't it though i don't know this is hard. Okay, so and all these mini consoles are coming out at the moment and there's lots of mini handhelds and they're kind of remakes of the new consoles. Now, they've just announced the Game Boy Ultra. Now, this is at, because CES has been on this week in America and this has been demoed there and a lot of the, you know, the mainstream tech sites who don't really go that big on retro, like Gizmodo, we're going to link in our, in our show notes, they've been demoing this product um, and kind of showing off and explaining a bit about what it is. So essentially, this looks like a bit of a... Is it a reboot of the Game Boy Advance then, or the Pocket? No, or uh, color, this or? seems to be a brand new kind of Game Boy that has a LCD screen, USB-C ports for charging. So that's really modern, isn't it? USB-C. Yeah. A six-hour battery life, separate outputs for the left and right audio, and it also might support Game Boy Color or Pocket Game Boy carts as well, so... So the, all, the original carts do play on this system. And yeah. looking at it, I mean, it does look like a Game Boy Color, doesn't it? The, the shell of it. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, they're, they're calling it Game Boy Ultra temporarily at the moment. So I'm wondering what Nintendo are going to do about this. Because Nintendo don't take kindly to uh, <laughs> the, 
their designs being used. Yeah, I mean, this is, it looks exactly like a Game Boy. But interestingly, they do say that that's the development name of it. And it's by Hyperkin as well, who are a very established kind of a third-party company. Yeah, and but it hasn't got the Game Boy branding on the actual system itself, if you look at it. No, there's no word Game Boy there. <laughs> but the D-pad looks the same, the start and select and all of the... Uh, even the speakers at the side? Are... Yeah, I mean, the, the design is pretty much identical. But apparently it's made of aluminium as well, which, um, from reading about it, apparently it's got a nice kind of hefty feel in your hand. Yeah, you and know, does an Ultra sound like Ultra 64, which was the uh, test name for the uh, N64? Yeah, maybe that's, where, maybe that's where they got it from. But I think, from what I've seen about this, I mean, they're obviously appealing to retro gamers as well, but apparently one of the big uses they're hoping people are going to use this device for is for chiptune music. Yeah, because the Game Boy was really cool, actually, for making chiptune music. My friend had a, a thing called Nano Loops, which was like a cart that you put in, and it'd be like a little tracker, but it was more kind of like Fruity Loops. You know, you put little dots in certain areas, and yeah. then you'd be able to make this really cool Game Boy music. That's why I'm guessing they've probably got separate left and right yeah. outputs so that you can have some mad stuff going on. I mean, I've not seen many details about how this works. I mean, they're hoping it's going to be released for under $100, which is, you know, bargain price. Yeah. But whether it's going to be emulation, you know, maybe it's going to be an ARM-based thing with an emulator that, on boot. But I always remember, I mean, that, that kind of really dirty analog sound that the original Game Boy had. That sounded fat when you plugged it into an amplifier. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really good. Yeah, I, I, I did a gig uh, years ago with a guy called Boy Blue, and he was playing music off a Game Boy, and he was actually in a bar, and he was like, had this Game Boy strapped to him, and he was walking on top of everyone's tables whilst they were drinking. <laughs> like, just playing this crazy music. It was great. Yeah, you look that weird, you're not going to get beaten up in a bar for doing that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to find out more about this, we'll keep an eye on the project and we'll put that in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Well, we're talking about Nintendo. Um, never thought I'd see this headline. The PlayStation 2 has been beaten in sales for the first time in 18 years. Really, by what? What could it be? The PlayStation. What could it be? <laughs> no, honestly, is it doing that well? The uh, Nintendo Switch. Is the it? Nintendo Switch has beaten the first year sales of the PS2 in My Japan. My God, the first system to do that since the year 2000. Now it's interestingly because the dates are actually quite close. The PS2 came out in Japan on March the fourth, two thousand. The Switch was released on March the third last year. It's like literally a day difference. It turns out in its first year, the PS2 sold. 3.1 million units and the Switch has just surpassed that with 3.25 million units. So pretty tight, but it is a first system in 18 years to actually beat the PS2 in terms of first year sales. Which in itself is pretty nuts. And also Nintendo of America tweeted this out this week, that in America uh, the Switch is doing rather well as well, and it turns out within 10 months the Nintendo Switch has become the fastest selling video game system of all time in America. Wow. Overtaking the Mega Drive, the NES, the Atari 2600. And there was me being a cynic all those months ago, and the Switch isn't going to do anything. <laughs> I do remember, I did think that today. I thought, did Ravi actually say, I don't think it's going to be a success? Yeah, I probably did. If you, if you go, <laughs> nobody go back and look. <laughs> but I mean, obviously, I love my Switch, and it is a system that I, I game most on these days. I mean, I've been playing Mario Odyssey like all over Christmas. Amazing game. If you love Mario 64, there are some bits in that game as well that actually are like the original Mario. It goes back into 2D. Yeah. So you go through a tunnel then, uh, you get like original 2D Mario and it goes back to kind of 3D and oh, stuff. Oh, cool. Great homage to the classics. And obviously we did a video over Christmas. Mm, yeah. It was all playing the Switch. And uh, if you want to check that out, it's on my YouTube channel. I'll put that in, uh, in our show notes this week as well. I mean, it was the first time you'd really played the Switch, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I've had a, a couple of plays, but um, it, was, it was quite a nice machine, yeah. I, I quite like it. It was a bit glitchy, actually, with some of the four-player stuff that we did. But I, I can see the appeal. It's It's... I've decided it's not really my thing. It's more like couch gaming, I yeah, think, which is yeah. what I like about it. It's that local... You know, there are not many systems where you can sit around and have like a four-play game with your mates the, on your couch. And the thing I like about it is that all the retro titles are kind of coming out on it, you know, and that's that's really cool. It's really riding this uh, retro wave. That's why we mention it so much. Well, there was actually a little... Um, I don't know if it's fake or not. This was on Reddit the other day, and a lot of people said it, it must be fake, it's not real. But if it is fake, it's done really well. And it was showing the next the gen of the Switch's firmware, and in there was the virtual console to play NES and oh, SNES yeah. games. Yeah, yeah, because they have said they're going to support the older stuff, so yeah. It makes sense to. I mean, you look at the Wii and the Wii U, I mean, God, I, I bought loads of like classic Nintendo games on those, and it's like, you know, 
Good games, good games. You just games, end up buying your games five times, don't you, Dan? That's oh, the problem. Annoying. Yeah, it's annoying in that, in that <laughs> five respect. Five copies, yeah. You think, oh, it's only a fiver, but then by the time you've added them all up, you spent about 400, 400 <laughs> on these games you've already got. And they're just rubbing their hands. <laughs> Now, this is quite an interesting little trend that's happening in the, the demo scene world at the moment. I mean, you, you've always been in the demo scene, haven't you? I, I've absolutely loved demos. And if people don't know what demos are, they're not games. They're kind of just technical demonstrations of what you can do on your machine. Now, a lot of them are kind of taken from meme culture and stuff like that. And you'll have a lot of videos playing. So uh, one that's been going around that I've been noticing on everything is this uh, thing called Bad Apple. Now, uh, can I play your little sample? Go on, then. Yeah. You, you tell Yeah, that's proper yeah. demo scene music. <laughs> so what's this running on then? So this was kind of a meme that was created. And then people have made this thing called stylized shadow art. Okay. Which is kind of a, a shadow on based on this music Looks video. like a negative kind of thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's kind of like a negative. But a lot of people have realized this negative, you can kind of downscale and used to display video on stuff like the Amstrad CPC. You can play it on. You can play it on C64. There's there's versions coming out for absolutely everything. I even saw a Vectrex version right. of it, which is insane. But the most impressive version I've seen of it is someone's actually coded it into Teletext. No way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, teletext, you're talking, it was really, I mean, the original teletext was run on BBC Micros, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, so you could run it on BASIC. Yeah. Yeah, and they've somehow converted these shadow graphics into kind of fitting in the teletext little drawings, and it's a full animation with music and everything, it's absolutely insane. It kind of reminds me a bit of like, um, you know, ANSI art that you'd see on BBSs and that kind of yeah, thing, probably same yeah. kind of technique, I guess, you know, especially with the shadows and that kind of stuff. The shadowy silhouette thing, and I think this is a, a kind of new style that's going to come out, and it looks really cool, one of the most impressive demos I've seen in ages. It never ceases to amaze me, you know, what they can do with new systems, it, with the old systems, new stuff they can do with it, it's like... You look at that and you thought, how is that even possible on like an Amstrad? Yeah, because or... like last year I was watching a revision, which is the big demo yeah. competition, and they they were releasing all these Mega Drive demos, and they were just absolutely mind blowing. Because all these guys that create these demos, they find all the little techniques and tricks that everybody's been doing for years and years and years. They use them all to the maximum and push these machines like far beyond what they were meant to do. And especially with, I mean, you mentioned, I saw a few of those Mega Drive demos last year as well. And I didn't, I obviously didn't think there was a Mega Drive scene back in the day because unless you had like a Mega CD, no one could afford CD writers when that came out. Yeah. And you couldn't make your own cartridges. But now that we have stuff like EverDrives and you can just download them and stuff, it actually opens up these previously closed systems yeah. for people to experiment with. Which and just to do absolutely mad things with. Yeah. Push it far beyond it was ever meant to be. Teletext was not meant to do that. <laughs> <laughs> or was it? Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to go to a demo party there. That's got to be on oh, our agenda. Yeah, they they look majorly cool. Yeah, one of these really sleazy, like, five-day ones in, like, you know, middle of nowhere in a field in Poland or somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. So if you didn't have any going on, actually, because I often find out about these after they've been on. Yeah, I think, I think revision... Is the big is the big one to go to. We, we need to go there one day, Dad. Yeah, there's any really underground ones as well, you know. Do yeah, I think there's a there. UK one that happens in the south uh, in a small village, and there's like 15 people. Isn't uh, that the one the that sea. DJ Echo like? I know Hoffman, Hoffman. Hoffman yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know Echo does one as well. I'm sure he's yeah. told us in the past. So yeah, if you know about any of these, they're normally always in like really posh towns that no one'd expect, aren't they? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tunbridge Wells or somewhere. Yeah, not the <laughs> demo has turned up. Yeah. So uh, yeah, do let us know if you know about any. Um, I feel like you know I'm asking for like invitations to a rave in like 1991. <laughs> <laughs> show at the retrohour.com uh, we did talk about the Game Boy and stuff before I mean obviously a big problem back in the old days when you had a handheld system and I mean you've actually just got a new handheld system so this is well timed yeah um, it was the batteries wasn't it it was the batteries you'd have people stuck with their game gear battery charger straight next to the wall the um, Atari Lynx I know yeah. they improved it in the second version but it wasn't much of an improvement you know the batteries would absolutely drain uh, batteries would leak acid everywhere if you left them in places because it was all just alkaline. You know, well, now there's these new NIH, NIMH um, batteries, which are basically rechargeable batteries, but with lithium inside, and they are a lot more powerful. So these are just kind of drop-in replacements? Yeah, they, they're literally, they look like AA batteries. There's yeah. no kind of difference 
apart from them being about 21 quid for four. Are these the ones with the USB ports on them? No, no. Okay, I've no, seen no, some of those these, recently. These, these are called Any Loops. Okay. Now, I use them, and they're by Panasonic, and it's a special technology they've invented. And the whole idea of Any Loops is that after a year, they still retain 85% of the power, and even after five years, they've got 65% of the power. So they're still holding a lot more power than the other ones, and it's lithium inside. You know the stuff that you'd have on your laptop batteries? Yeah, yeah. That's the stuff inside of it, rather than the, the acid. nickel cadmium, wasn't it before? Yeah, 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 the nasty stuff. How do you how do you charge them then? Do you use a normal battery recharger? Yeah, just a rechargeable battery point. It takes quite a long time, but these last forever. Trust me, I put one in my Xbox One controller. I've not charged it for six months. Oh, really? It's okay. insane. So imagine using these on your uh, Atari Lynx. You'll get a, <laughs> a lot more life. And we're gonna post you a link to on Reddit, which is: Is it safe to use modern? rechargeable batteries because you know a lot of people worry about their old systems and actually without the battery leakage and if you check your devices at the right voltage yeah it's safe okay it's gonna last a lot longer well let's talk about this sexy new bit of kit that you bought oh god yeah i bought a a, a white game gear these are really rare then yeah i think there was ten thousand made and they've just been given out to developers and uh to uh staff but this one was in amazing condition so i'm just like gonna hoard it away for 10 years <laughs> until there's none left in the world and then be like <laughs> <laughs> destroy every other one yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is your uh nice little bonus from your cryptocurrency that you uh i know you're quite into yeah yeah i'm, I'm doing a lot of crypto and stuff <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah it, it seemed to pay off this week so i was like <laughs> well, get a game not? gear <laughs> it's i mean i've always wanted a game gear i'd like have you got another one to play? or? Yeah, yeah, it? that one's going to be put in storage. <laughs> I'm going to get another one to play. But then I was looking at some of the amazing stuff you can do with the Game Gear, and it's insane. You can add LCD mods in there. You can have, like, all kinds of stuff. Put, like, HDMI outputs on the back. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that kind of thing going on. I mean, I'm actually really inter- interested in handhelds again at the moment. It might be the Switch has actually reinvigorated yeah, re- my interest. It reinvigorated me. I thought, I'll get a Switch. No, let's get an old weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had a couple of Game Boys, and I really, I mean, I kick myself because I've had a few chances in the last couple of years to buy and Atari Lynx at a pretty good price. Yeah, yeah. And I never do it. And then I was at a, a show not long ago, and there was a load of Lynx games, but no consoles anywhere. So I was like, oh, if, you know, if I went to an event, maybe even play Blackpool, I'll do this. And there might be both there. And I will. Well, that's it as well. The Game Gear's got an EverDrive as well. So, yeah. you know, you can just bust in. And also, it supports kind of. Um, uh, Sega Master System stuff. So yeah. So if you've got demos and there's a big homebrew scene at the moment, so you can just get them Master System ones and run them on your old. It's actually got a video of this bad apple on the Game Gear. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Yeah. That demo we're talking about. Yeah, right. yeah. So have it's you, everywhere. Have you opened the box and tried it out? Then does it work? Oh yeah, it works. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> it would have sent it back if it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Open the box and there's like a brick in there or something. Yeah. <laughs> a picture of one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get scammed by that, did you? Anyway. Yeah. yeah, that's really good to know, though. Because I mean, it was always a big issue with those systems. The you know, batteries would cost you know more than the console would after yeah, a year. Or, or, or you've left it in your drawer and then all the acids come out. <laughs> you just yeah. like, oh my god, not good. Now, let's talk about some uh, text adventure news then before we get into uh, this week's special guest. Tell oh, us yeah. about Adventuron. Yeah, so this has been submitted by a listener called Chris Ainsley, and this is really cool. It's a it's a browser based text adventure offering system. Wow, okay. And game system. So you can basically online have your old, you know, you are lost in the swirling mist and all of these kind of games. It's got a full parser on it and you can kind of program them, but you people have also been doing conversions to them. So What of classic Old school text yeah, adventures. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, John Wilson of Xenobuy Software has ported 11 classic games already to Adventure On. Yeah, the Hobbit's on here. Yeah, there'll be more to follow. So uh, it features uh, code completion, embedded documents, and theming support as well. That's actually looking at it. I mean, they're talking about the fact that it's a model based adventure creation language mm. um, inspired by a lot of the techniques that Scott Adams used, uh, Quill, you know, the old systems, the early adventure systems. Um, I, I think that's awesome because text adventures were, you know, the purest old school adventure games, weren't they? I mean, that's where it all began, isn't it? You know, with, with these original text yeah, adventures. Yeah, and, and I think we all did it as well. You know, I remember sitting there with my mate's BBC programming one. I think I think we had one where we were in Tony Blair was chasing us down an alleyway or something. Was, <laughs> really? On a yeah, BBC? Interesting. Yeah. I, one game that we played at school that I guess probably does fall 
into the genre of text adventure thinking about it. It was a game called Granny's Garden. Okay. And I've shared a couple of pictures of this before on our Facebook. And you'd essentially, I mean, from what I haven't played it for years, I must get like a, either an emulator for the BBC fired up or maybe actually an original system. I'd be good to put on my to buy list this year. But Granny's Garden, though, you'd have to escape this evil witch. Yeah. And it was actually terrifying at the time. And if the witch caught you, she sent you home. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously child-friendly and stuff, but... Me and my friends at school would sit there mesmerised by it. You know, the fact that you could walk like forward and like what you'd see up ahead. And it, it was, I mean, looking at this as well, it kind of supports those, you know, kind of mid-80s text adventure style games with the, the rudimentary graphics. Yeah, and I reckon it's really cool that you can theme it as well. So you may be able to do the, the system that it's themed by. And, you know, more people that get involved with this, more games are going to get ported and new games created. You know, you might even be able to do collaborative creation of text adventures that would be cool and because it's um web-based as well no installation you just run no, browser. Yeah, you just need a browser you might be able to even do it on your phone you know? yeah that's awesome so if you want to find out more about that and um, yeah just imagine like being able to play zork and stuff just on the bus on your phone it's like <laughs> so pretty good. amazing i'll put that in this week's show notes at the retro hour.com right then guys well thank you for checking out episode number 104 of the retro hour podcast we'll be out again next friday available from all of your favorite podcast clients and uh, whichever platform you do listen on it's always nice if we get some reviews in there as well um you know all those five star ratings and thumbs up and uh, nice comments and stuff always help us get up the chart we did have someone asking us this week actually are we going to be on Spotify um, Spotify hasn't done the UK service yet okay um, I I think they also pick it as well they don't I thought allow, they were hand they don't, they don't allow submissions so we'll see so if anyone knows anyone at Spotify yeah, yeah. we we'll definitely get on that platform yeah just absolutely. send them a tenner <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for checking out this week's show um, don't forget the competition that's running at the moment to win those weekend passes for Play Expo in Blackpool you'll find that on the front page of theretrohour.com now let's get on one of our guests who will be joining us at Play Expo on our YouTubers panel. Uh, he's got some really cool stories. Uh, let's get nostalgia about Sega, Amstrad, a few of those uh, interesting telly stories as well. It's going to be a really good one. Daniel Ibbotson, a.k.a. Slopes Game Room, is our special guest on this week's Retro Hour podcast. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome this week's very special guest. Welcome to the show, Daniel Ibbotson, aka Slopes Game Room. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's, it's awesome. I've been listening to you guys loads recently. It's, it's wicked to be part of the show. Thank you. Oh, you're not sick of our voices yet, then, though? No, no, it's, it's a, a little bit of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm a bit flabbergasted. This is amazing. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, we're, we've got something very big coming up next month. You're going to be on our panel at mm. Play Expo Blackpool, which is uh, going to be very exciting. Oh, I'm crazy excited. Like, I haven't been to a, an expo in ages. In fact, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on the stage. The old Q and A. It's going to be brilliant, really, really cool. And I get to meet, I get to meet some other uh, YouTubers. I, you know, I talk to all the time, but I have never met. So yeah, well, it'll be this, really good. This is the first time we've done a, a kind of YouTubers panel at a retro show, which is just fantastic. I think it's the first mm. in the UK. I think actually, because you know, you often get them at the big American shows, don't you? But there's not been one in the UK yet, so. Yeah, yeah, you always see those, like, all the American channels say, oh, I'm going to be at this expo, I'm going to be at that expo, and, you know, you just never see that in the UK channel. So, no, I think, it, hopefully it's the start of something. Exactly. <laughs> Show the Americans how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we're going to invade, this is going to be good. <laughs> well, let's get on to you then. I mean, it's uh, always a question we like to start with, to get a bit of background. I mean, what was your first ever gaming experience then going all the way back to the start well probably the same as everyone else i don't remember i don't i don't know if this was my first ever one but the first one i remember um the first computer i had was an amstrad amstrad cpc 464 with nice. the color monitor thankfully nice. and um i think it was bridget it was either bridget or oh mummy obviously i had the whole selection of those amsoft games and um i think it was bridget I'm pretty sure. I just remember being uh, playing Bridget and not just every single guy falling in the, <laughs> in the water because I couldn't keep up. Um, but yeah, I think it was Bridget. I think it was Bridget. And were you like a, a big Amstrad fan then? Did you? So now obviously, at the time, most people think back then and think C64 Specky. The Amstrad was kind of an underrated platform, but it was kind of you know the third player. I always think it was a machine that didn't get as much love as it deserved compared to the others. 
Well, luckily for me, I mean, I didn't know of anything else. You know, my my mum bought the Amstrad for the for the house. You know, for the family, and uh, everyone I know had one. And uh, unless there were people out there that didn't that had something else, I, I only ever knew of the Amstrad's existence. Um, so you know, I'd, I'd always go down to Boots and you know all these other little shops to pick up my nine new one pound ninety nine game. You know, uh, and maybe a, ca- a a stack of <laughs> five tapes to record all my friends' games and vice versa, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know of any other system because, I, I mean, I was just too young. I was just so in the mindset of Amstrad CPC. Nothing else mattered, you know. So It, yeah. it was a magical day when we discovered tape-to-tape copying and worked on games, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I remember it was actually <laughs> part of the reason I got a dual-tape system so I could record tapes <laughs> from other games. So you hadn't seen any other systems? Like, did you go into a shop one day and see Sega or Nintendo I'm, I'm, and I mean, stuff? probably... Probably. I mean, I remember, I mean, one of my earliest memories is I was quite late into my primary school days. Oh, no, no, let's say mid to my primary school days, maybe. And I remember seeing a master system and I think I was, there was definitely Alex kid I played and something else. Um, I think it was Pengu. And I was just so, such a massive fan of the Amstrad. You know, I was such a fanboy. I was like, this is crap compared to, I don't know, like Roland on the ropes. And, you know, <laughs> and it obviously wasn't, you know, like the, the games I was playing were definitely not as good as what was being played over there on the uh, Master System, but I was just such a massive fanboy of it um, until that day that a Mega Drive dropped under the Christmas tree. Then, see you later, Amstrad. I never looked back, you know. You never fancy getting your hands on a GX4000 then? Well, I didn't know that existed until the internet came along, in all honesty. Um, I don't think anyone I else really, did, really though, want one now. So, yeah. so, <laughs> did you get any, like, Amstrad magazines, or were you involved in any of the culture at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I used to get the magazines every year, uh, every year, um, every month or whenever it was, get those tapes. I think it was um, uh, Amstrad Action, Amstrad Action. Um, I was just really more into the pictures and things. I used to trace all the characters. I was I was obsessed with Dizzy before I became, like, you know, really into Sonic the Hedgehog and whatever Sega was pushing in my way. Like, um, Dizzy was plastered around my wall. I remember I had, like, Dizzy T-shirts and everything. <laughs> I was really, really into Dizzy. Not, I don't think I ever completed them as a kid, but... Um, yeah, uh, in fact, Dizzy was uh, fast food. Dizzy was the first game I ever completed as well. So, oh wow, yeah, that was a good one, wasn't it? It's like kind of Pac-Man clone. I remember. Fast yeah, food, one of those yeah. maze games. Yeah, it's kind of push blocks. Great game. Actually, mm. speak, speaking of Dizzy as well, I know because we interviewed the Oliver Twins last year, and they were telling us that they actually did all the development for the um, Spectrum Dizzy games on an Amstrad, and actually put that down a serial cable because they didn't like developing on the Spectrum. So Yeah, the keyboard was yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they really? That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. I'm hoping to interview them one day and do a complete history of them. So that sort of stuff, I love hearing that. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a point to the, point to the Amstrad there. Yes, yes. It's always points to the Amstrad. Everything else is just dead to me. I, <laughs> I wish I still had my Amstrad. I really do. So you said you found a Mega Drive under the Christmas tree. Was that your first console then? Yes, yes. I remember um, the thing was, like, I, I was a definitely a mummy's boy. And <laughs> whenever my mum would say something, oh, that game isn't as good as an Amstrad, is it? I'm like, no, definitely not, definitely not. And then I remember leading up to Christmas, uh, she kept saying, that Mega Drive looks quite good, doesn't it? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it does, it does. And then, uh, and then it clicks. I went, am I going to get a Mega Drive for Christmas? <laughs> and I started seeing all the rumours, uh, 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 everything was blowing up about this Sonic the Hedgehog character and you couldn't help but be sucked into it. And then when I finally dropped under there and I got Fantasia, ugh, uh, Sonic 1, Sonic 2 and Streets of Rage, like, got to be the best Christmas ever. Absolutely. Life-changing. You know, because people probably forget what it was like. I mean, that kind of jump from the 8-bit platforms to something like the Mega Drive. I mean, at the time, mm. it seemed like having an arcade machine in your house, didn't it? Oh, majorly, majorly. I mean, if you look at like the difference between a PlayStation 3 and a PlayStation 4, I mean, there were noticeable differences. But now you go back from the 8-bit to the 16-bit eras and, 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 you know, from 16 to 32 and stuff like that, they're huge, huge jumps. Um, incredibly noticeable difference. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And those those were fantastic titles that you mentioned. The first ones that you got, you know, Streets yeah, of Rage. Well, wow, Fantasia, not so much, but <laughs> <laughs> graphically nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, it's oh, what did they do? They, they chip tuned up like classical music, and it just did not work. Like donk, donk, donk. It's really, really. Yeah. As a kid, I loved it. I didn't know any better. You know. What was your kind of favorite game on the Mega Drive then? Out of all of them. Um. My favourite game on the Mega Drive is my favourite game of all time. Uh, Sonic 3 and Knuckles is a complete game, those two together. Um, my most popular video is Streets of Rage, uh, and, and Streets of Rage is one that's always stuck with me. Like To this day, even though everyone prefers two, I prefer one. Uh, it's definitely a nostalgia pulling on there. But um, 
yeah, it, it's such an obvious one, but Sonic, uh, uh, Sonic 3 and Knuckles and Streets of Rage are the best games, absolute best games. So now recently there's been this kind of, obviously with the Nintendo miniature versions coming out, the Classic and the SNES Mini, mm-hmm. it kind of feels like, I know there is like the third party of the game's kind of Mega Drive knockoff, but it does kind of feel like there does need to be a classic plug-and-play system that's good like the original system was, you can play all these old games on again, I think. Yeah, it would be amazing. But I mean, but I actually saw today that, um, is it oh, is it RetroPie or a company like that are, are releasing some like Mega Drive, Dreamcast and Saturn uh, peripherals, uh, brand new ones. So you're going to be able to pick up official wireless Genesis. I think they're Genesis, but Genesis controllers for your Mega Drive, which is really cool. So uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there needs to be systems that do that sort of stuff, though, don't they? That, the way the way that Nintendo did it, I think. Actually, speaking of accessories, I mean, you know, back in the day, did you have any for your Mega Drive? Then did you have like a 32X or a Mega CD or anything like or that? Or a Power Glove? <laughs> no, 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 I had um, I had the Menacer, uh, yes. and I remember I don't remember playing it that much. I mean, I didn't have, there weren't that many games for it. I think I sold my copy of Terminator Two, uh, and then I got a Menacer that Christmas. I was like, no, like I could finally have played that game, you know. Um, so I had the Menacer. Uh, I had like you know third party knockoff controllers, which were actually perfect controllers. They weren't they weren't different shapes. They just had things like Turbo and stuff on them. Um, but other than that, I didn't really have anything else. I, I, I just had, I had a really big collection of games. Although I do remember the biggest, one of the biggest gaming decisions of my life was, do I buy Theme Park for the Mega Drive or do I buy a Sega 32X? <laughs> and I chose Theme Park. But I, I've got a 32X now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I remember the, you know, the first time I walked into a gaming shop and actually saw a Mega CD, though. I mean, looking oh, back at it, it, it looks quite rudimentary now, you know, the graphics and stuff. But seeing, like, videos and stuff running on it, I mean, do you have any kind of memories of that? Did it impress you back then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. My um, my cousin got a Mega CD. Um, and, yeah, just seeing Road Avenger and I'm just watching him play it. And I'm like, this is insane because in my mind he was controlling that car. And obviously he wasn't. But it just felt... I can't believe this is it. This is it. We've made it. Like we're playing full on cartoons. That was such a big thing. Like when you put in Aladdin and, you know, Castle of Illusion, it looks like you're playing, you know, one of those Saturday morning cartoons. And when you got the mega CD, I was like, wow, like <laughs> cartoons on a TV, like from a, through a console. It's incredible. It can't get any better than this. <laughs> no, no. I don't think graphics can ever look better than this. <laughs> so did you get into like wider Sega culture and were you kind of drooling over these uh, strange add ons that were all coming out in the magazines? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I eventually, I eventually got them all minus a couple of handhelds. Like I don't own a Nomad or anything like that. But uh, um, I, I, the the only one that I skipped over was the Sega Saturn. I got a PlayStation when the Sega Saturn came out. But then what was really cool is every time my friend down the road, who was a, a Sega, an absolute Sega, nothing else mattered. Every time he moved up one, he would sell me all his games for a pound each. So you know, halfway through the Mega Drive's life, he went into the Mega Drive, and I bought like. 35 master system games like really really good ones for like 30 odd quid uh, and then the same happened when he moved to the dreamcast and i got his entire saturn collection um including some brilliant games all, you know, all the knights games everything in that you know i had um burning rangers the works um and then i bought all his dreamcast games when he moved away from that as well so well, did you have a game gear as well as well um i had a game gear but after the life of the game i didn't have a game gear in the day back in the day Okay, like, like bought it retroactively. The, the, the yeah. batteries were too expensive for most kids to have them back then, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I've got a, I've got a pretty decent GameCube collect, um, Game Gear collection, but like I say, I bought that. Um, I want to say in the Saturn era, I reckon. Well, Ravi actually got. I mean, you've picked up a really rare Game Gear, haven't you? This I, one? I've got a white Game Gear, which is Ooh. Uh, yeah, very rare. Do you know if the Game Gear is um, multi-region? Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Because there's an incredible uh, Japanese theme of the Game Gear. There's so many really, really good Japanese exclusive games I, I, I've found. Yeah, and I've, I've seen a lot of crazy mods that you can do with Game Gear now. So you can add LCD screens in them. You can have all, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, increase the battery life with uh, lithium batteries and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Make it last more than an hour. Yeah. <laughs> That is full on, isn't it? Imagine if you like went on a holiday, you'd have to get like a whole pack of batteries for one journey and then a whole pack of batteries for the journey home as well. Well, I had, um, I had a friend who had Atari Lynx and I remember him getting um, getting like a, a battery charger. You remember you get those rechargeable batteries you put in these little like boxes, yeah. plug it into the wall, it took about six hours to charge and you get about 40 minutes of play, I think, on it, yeah. Well, my, my Game Gear had... Um, you could put extra batteries because they, they, they bought some third party thing where you could put extra batteries so like double the amount of batteries in each side 
So it weighed an absolute ton when you put in, like, what would that have been, like, 12 batteries maybe something like that yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> nice fire risk in your bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's that that ain't fitting in anyone's pockets like you know you need a backpack for that so did you ever find yourself going to shops and hanging around the sega area or going to big gaming events and kind of hanging around the sega store no sadly i didn't i didn't know of any gaming events when i was young i mean i, I went to I, there was a few uh, retro game shops um uh, that did, you know, competitions and stuff like that, you know, to win whatever tat they'd managed to get hold of. Um, I used to go to a few of those, and um, I remember I won a couple of games, you know. Uh, I remember there was a Double Dragon competition I'd done quite well in once. <laughs> um, but no, I didn't go to any major competitions. But I, yeah, I would always spend as much time as possible whenever I went, you know, to the shops in game shops. I, yeah, I was, I lived and breathed it. I think everyone kind of remembers their local game shop that they used to go to when they were a kid. I mean, have you, have you oh, yes. any stick in your mind? What were they like and where were they? Um, so the youngest one, um, I suppose, near the end of my primary school days, uh, there was there was a place called Oriel in, um, uh, in Kent where I lived. Um, and the guy who owned it was an absolute idiot he was so nasty he'd be watching you on the security cameras to make sure you weren't doing anything dodgy and all this it was the tiniest shop that he could if he just turned around the corner he could see me you know uh he was an absolute douche but uh, i remember going there all the time and just you know i'd go on this mental like almost like hour-long bike journey each way just to go and rent you know whatever game it may be i think i'd done it all the way up to the playstation one era i was renting things like twisted metal and stuff um but the really cool thing about that place is when they started closing down I started to get to know him a little bit more and he let me go upstairs and, you know, pick out random things to buy. And I spent a couple of hundred pounds in there that day. And I remember as I was walking down the stairs, I was like, what's that? And there was like this, this Discman looking thing with Sega written on it. And he goes, I don't know. You can have it if you want like 10, 15 quid. And it was a multi-mega, wow. <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, probably my best pickup I've ever had. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was, that was a really cool day because he had loads of games upstairs that had never been opened. I bought a crazy amount of mega CD games for like five pound each, you know? Yeah. Uh, but we're talking 20 years ago or something. I don't know. <laughs> do you, do you know <laughs> but it was okay to pick up games that cheap, you know. Do you know what's in that shop's place now? Do you know what it is today? I think it's a coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, my local gaming shop's now Cocktail Bar. I actually went there about, about a year ago. And it felt weird to know that I've been standing there, you know, playing video games like 20 years <laughs> earlier. Really bizarre. Mine's like a golf shop where <laughs> they sell like gothic stuff. <laughs> when you saw a Saturn eventually, mm-hmm. what did you think of it? I remember seeing the Saturn in Argos, uh, the first time I ever saw one, uh, one like, you know, going there, demo unit. Uh, but by this time, I already had the PlayStation, so I suppose it was quite late on. Um, and I was playing on Daytona USA, which I, I remember playing it and thinking, this is quite cool, this is quite cool. But over on my PlayStation, I was playing things like uh, Wipeout 29, oh, not 2097, I was playing the original Wipeout by this point, and games like that. And Destruction Derby, you know, like, and I was like, that's the future like you know cars that are fully smashing into each other you can see the damage and that futuristic racing with techno music and all this sort of stuff so that's the future and i felt like the 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 sega saturn was almost dated the first time i ever played on one and then after that everything i ever read in magazines was about how it's on its way out and you can pick up a saturn now for less than 100 pounds and all this sort of stuff and um and it wasn't long after that. Like I say, I bought my my, my friend's entire saturn collection for you know a pound a pop so <laughs> Well, later after that, the Dreamcast came out. And uh, how did you feel about Sega in those days? Did you think this was the kind of last breath of Sega or this was the revival? Or? So I was I was, I was, was in sort of, I suppose, mid-secondary school by the end of the PlayStation era, I suppose, when everything was moving towards that. And uh, DJing had taken over my life in a huge way. Like, I was obsessed with DJing. I would just carry around CD cases everywhere I went trying oh i could mix this with this and every time i got a new single i'd try and mix it with every other song i had like i was so into uh, djing uh, and you know my records and what have you um and i wasn't that bothered about video games almost anymore and i remember when my friends were all getting n64s and they're playing banjo and kazooie all i wanted to do was just mix mm. and it was a, it was a bit of a gray area in my gaming life that was and then i remember picking up a dreamcast mag uh, another sega saturn magazine because I obviously had all this new influx of Sega Saturn games. And I remember seeing all these previews for this Sonic Adventure game coming out. And um, uh, I was just blown away by the look of what Sonic was going to be. Because I, I was very disappointed that there was never a good 3D Sonic game, except for, you know, Sonic R and stuff like that. Um, but I'd been playing things like Croc and Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation. And I really wanted a good 3D Sonic game. And when I finally got that Dreamcast, I was 
absolutely blown away i was fully sucked into to, to gaming again i got hooked into the um uh down that be you know, to put uh, go online with my dreamcast and playing choo choo rocket online and and pushing those back buttons to go you're too slow and all that sort of <laughs> stuff i just got absolutely soaked into to, to gaming again and i started collecting all my retro games again uh getting into emulation as well um emulating games on my dreamcast when i finally worked out how to do that sort of stuff um but yeah, yeah, that, the Dreamcast was that me fully jumping in deep end again. That kind of revived your interest in gaming then. Obviously. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But it was a wonderful system, and I mean, did it kind of break your heart when you saw that it wasn't going to be like you know the big system that everyone hoped it was going to be? Yeah, absolutely. But I am really happy to that it's got such an amazing fan base online nowadays. Normally, when you look back at the N sixty four. Even like, all of these retro consoles, there's always some bad things to say about them, but no one really talks about bad games on the Dreamcast at that much, you know. Um, the Dreamcast is a really, really uh, loved system, uh, and it, it's definitely in my top, I don't know, three or four consoles of all time. I think it's an incredible system. It's basically an arcade machine, isn't it? You know, the old Naomi ports. Did you become a fan of kind of any gaming TV at the time? I, I I always missed it when it was on. Um, I mean, obviously, I watched Games Master and stuff when I was younger. But um, I do remember actually uh, uh, becoming quite obsessed with you know tuning in. Oh, I'm going to forget what it's called. I think it's the Games Network on Sky when you have to tune in your Sky. Uh, this is obviously before the Dreamcast days, but I, mean, I suppose it was about the Dreamcast days actually. Yeah, and and they used to do these like weird European music videos uh, music but like they'd have gameplay footage over the top but they would never tell you what the gameplay is and I remember sitting there like what's this this is like Final Fantasy but there's Disney characters in it which obviously became Kingdom Hearts and I became really into like this weird one where you've seen all these little plant lives running around which became Pikmin and yeah I, I really got into that but all it was was just it was all the way through the night so I'd record it on VHS and I wish I still had those tapes but they'd be basically yeah just really up like that that ugly sort of European music, you know, the, you know really over the top synth stuff, with um yeah with like all this gameplay footage of whatever the new one on one fighting game from PlayStation is or whatever, and it was like the only way it was it was YouTube before YouTube I suppose. I was going to say it's, it's quite a creative way to show games off though actually when you think about it isn't it? Yeah yeah absolutely. Well you know you actually got involved in television a bit later I on. Did, didn't you? I did I did in the last <laughs> decade. So tell us how your adventure in television started then. <laughs> okay right so um me and my mates uh started you know we, we was having house parties was, their parents were really cool one of my friends and we'd always have house parties at his house and we'd you know be a bunch of you know, young lads just messing about and you know <laughs> getting on it uh it would really really lame though it was like dude you fell over you know we all thought we was like skater boys and, stuff. <laughs> and um then jackass came out and they're like oh my god they're doing what we're doing and stuff like that and then we'd all oh, that actually we're, we're quite lame aren't we and you know we'd try and up our game a bit and then you know Dave sanchez come out and we ended up making our own website and um we was getting at first we weren't getting that many but by the end we was getting i don't know 10 20 000 views of uh, I don't, I, i'm making up numbers now but a month i want to say I, I might be getting that completely wrong but we was getting a lot of views for us you know um and then we decided we'd make a a, a movie we'd call it 101 stunts an hour and uh, because we always thought when you watch these jackass-esque shows there's always lots of filler and we wanted to be like, bang 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 something else stupid something else stupid we got about halfway through and we was coming back with scars all ourselves and you know it was, it was really bad and i remember my wife getting really angry with me like you've got to stop doing this and she um me and my friend are sitting in the back of this car and she was driving along with his girlfriend and they were just telling us off like nothing will ever come from this we're like okay okay <laughs> and then um the ne- it was like a week later channel five got hold of us and said do you want to turn it into a tv show <laughs> I'm like, yes please <laughs> So, you know, about a year or so passed, we had meetings, loads of meetings, and then um, it basically turned into uh, Brainiac, which, in case there's anyone out there that don't know what that is, uh, some very intelligent guy would come on the screen and goes, uh, what would happen, uh, how, how does seasickness happen? So then they'd put us in a boat and make us all get seasick. You know, and there'd be the silly things like that, um, but a lot of the time it would focus on us uh having stupid stunts happen to us so for instance mine one of my big ones was i was uh, i'm scared of heights we all had a phobia and we had to conquer it so i was scared of heights so they strapped me to the top of a, a plane and whew, flew up into the sky to wow. see if it would you know you know conquering your fear um so Did yeah it work? there's loads of crazy stuff like that you know it's really good Did, are you scared of heights today then or did it cure you 
I'm not scared of flying, but okay. I'm still pretty scared of heights. <laughs> so, I did conquer my fear of flying, though. Like, I used to be like really bad on planes and stuff, but now I'm like head out. Well, head out the window, head up against the window, you know. <laughs> well, I think YouTube is a slightly safer place. Absolutely, but you can find <laughs> clips of all this on the tubes. <laughs> I know Ravi's been looking up a few today. He's been sending me the Saturday yeah. and the other. I was like, do you remember this? <laughs> do you we, remember we, it? we both do, yeah. 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 Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Like, hardly anyone knows it. It was really cool because for like, the, the year or so after it ended, um, randomly, me and all my friends that were in there, because we're all friends, the people that are in it, we all know each other, would randomly say, are you getting added by loads of Japanese people? Yeah, me too. So I'm like, okay, the show's being aired in Japan. And, oh, wow. You know, we're getting added by loads of people in Australia. Okay, it's over there. But we would never know any of this. We never got, like, I know, money I, for this, I, and they never told us any of this. They would just, it would just be there, you know. I was quite just... obsessed with the early days of Channel 5 with, um, oh, God, they had loads of stuff on there. Harry and Kosh and The Tribe yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> t- Topless Darts, I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you still got them on VHS, yeah, Ravi. <laughs> Well, I've been moving more, you know, more towards the present time. Obviously, you know, today you do a lot of YouTube, so you know, you still mm-hmm. the modern video market. Um, yeah. What inspired you to start like a, a gaming channel? And obviously, you've been a fan of gaming all your life. But when did you decide to kind of put the the television broadcasting experience and gaming together? Well, um, if you look at when my channel started, it was like 2011. But in fact, I didn't upload a video until like 2014. So I, always, I wanted to do it for a long time, even before then. I remember watching uh, loads of channels online. I think the, my, my earliest gaming memory channels that I see were, everyone says Angry Video Game Nerd, but, you know, it, he was one of the first I remember seeing uh, along with, I, I actually remember seeing Larry Bundy before yeah. I watched Angry Video Game Nerd. And um, the more I watched the more I was like, I want to do this, I want to do this. And it was Angry Video Game Nerd's um, uh, episode on Sword Quest, uh, where he actually told like an, an interesting story. It wasn't just the vulgar thing that he did. You know, it was an actual interesting story about something that I didn't know about. You know, you could win this chalice, you could win this real chalice, and you could win this real sword and all these other bits. And it was all to do with a video game. I was like, that is fascinating. That is so fascinating. Um, and Larry always done really interesting tidbits as well as being humorous. Um, and then obviously you had people like Lazy Game Reviews, which I think isn't. At, you, you guys have interviewed him in the past, haven't yeah. you? That, he, he's he was mind blowingly good because he would do things that are not interesting. That the, a history on calculators is not interesting, but he made a video that made it very, very interesting. I was just like, absolute perfect, perfect channel. Yeah, he should so have I, work on paper, should he? Um, LTR. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it, he'd done a video on the history of DRM. And uh, again, that to me isn't really an, a topic that I would probably look up because I wouldn't find that interesting. But he'd done it so well. I was like, this is so fat. I've watched the video several times. It's so good. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the sort of stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to, uh, lack of a better word, educate as well as be humorous, I suppose. Like, I wanted to find like these really interesting bits about retro gaming's past. Um, yeah, and that, that's basically what I did. It took a long time before I eventually pulled my thumb out and actually got and done it, but um, went and done it. But, you know, here I am. I'm doing it now. So, Well, your videos on YouTube are probably the most researched ones you've seen for gaming. Like, they're incredibly detailed. And yeah, how do you decide on what to choose and get all this research and, you know, find out how you're accurate? It's there is there is no answer it, 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 people ask me this all the time i don't know sometimes i'm reading anything from like a retro gamer magazine or i'm uh, i'm looking online at random blogs i'm like i have my my, my bookmarks history is so many different um blogs that i look at and find interesting stories and i'm like that's really cool you know or i'm watching another video and they'll bring up something and just pass it by and i'm like that's really cool and then i just go deep deep into searching about that one thing it, they they take a different amount of time each one you know i mean if i look at something like my my metroid complete history i, I probably spent months <laughs> working on that script honestly just like looking at what other people's opinions are as well as mine and trying to find any kind of history piece you know they they take a really long time to make but when they're done i'm just so proud of them you know um yeah that's it <laughs> and have you had any of the actual like game developers comment on any of your videos or anything like that Yes, recently, uh, as in within the last couple of weeks, I was oh, absolutely blown away. Ed Annunziata from <laughs> the guy who created Echo the Dolphin actually become a patron of mine because oh, wow. he liked my Echo the Dolphin <laughs> video so much, which is like, wow, like how cool is that? Um, 
uh, other ones I've been sent. I'll show you. I'll show you guys after the podcast. But I've actually been sent pictures of uh, Zombies Ain't My Neighbors Two, a game that was in development but never came. Well, I think it was a prototype that was made, um, but never come out. Um, and I keep, uh, please, please, can we talk again? I want to. I want to show more people Zombies Ain't My Neighbors Two because he liked my Zombies Ain't My Neighbors video. Uh, I've had um, Sandy White. Um, comment on the fact that i've done a video about him i've had uh what was one of the other ones i had one of the guys that created crash to insanity like my crash bandicoot videos and he's now collecting together all of the uh making of crash to insanity including all of its original name changes and stuff which i'll reveal and all that sort of stuff in there and early concept of what he looked like which is completely different to what he eventually looked like and i'm going to make a video entirely about that so yeah I've, i've had quite a lot of people uh come forward and it's nothing's more more rewarding and then you know that 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 game you like echo the dolphin i was so fascinated by that game and now that guy is a, a patron of mine. <laughs> how cool is that i think that is like the power of you know social media and youtube and that the fact that it does bring bring you closer to these people that kind of you know when you're a kid you'd read about them in magazines but you never thought you'd get a chance to ever talk to them they were like like celebrities oh, weren't they but yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i, I mean i've got to meet um yuzo kushiro recently at a, a, a data discs party uh, the guy who created the music for streets of rage yeah. Wow. Oh, oh my god. Like I'm in nineteen ninety-two, Christmas Day, oh Boxing Day, I was at my nan's house. My mum her Streets of Rage was like, the music's quite good, isn't it? And I'm like, it is. And I remember <laughs> making mixtapes of this Streets of Rage music and then what what are we talking like twenty oh, 30 years? No, 28, 30 years later almost. I'm 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 in a club listening to his music, meeting him and having my record signed. Like it you can you can't predict this stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that you covered recently that I find really interesting is uh, failed Kickstarters. And I was mm. wondering, uh, would you ever make a Kickstarter just for it to fail so you can get it in your list? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm shooting myself in the foot in a big way because I am working on a board game with my wife to make a Kickstarter. And I think I'm going to have a lot of <laughs> enemies. <laughs> so I upload it, you know. Um, I actually uploaded, uh, it's Wednesday today, I uploaded a, a Kickstarter video about an hour before we started this podcast as well. So, Well, what, what, what kind of Kickstarters um, stick in your mind as ones that were particularly <laughs> you know, outrageous or tragic or any you've covered in there? Well, I'll, the one I've just done, I mean, it's going to be, it's one of those things that I really don't want to talk about too much because it's so controversial. It's like, ah, um, it's a board game that basically got very far into its development there's a couple of hiccups. The, the the board gamers that that backed it were like, "Oh, you you should do it like this." And she was, like, "Oh, okay." And you know, everyone was working together. It was really nice. It was only eighty five backers, seven thousand eight hundred and fifty, which on the grand scheme of things isn't that much money. And then halfway through, she said, "It was uh, sorry, it was a board game about the solar system as well." Uh, she she announced that she 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 couldn't continue because the sun, as in the sun in the sky, was telling her not to. Um, so she started hearing voices saying that the board game is giving away too many of the sun's secrets. So oh, she had wow. to stop making the board game. Um, so that was quite an interesting one. <laughs> that's something that I've been looking up a lot over the last few weeks working on that video. So that's definitely stuck in my mind. Um, everyone wants me to cover things like the Vega Plus and things like that. And in time, in time, it will come. <laughs> I know you've been doing stuff on um, Guru Larry's channel as well, actually. I mean, mm-hmm. how, how did you get to... What's your relationship with Larry then? How, how do you know him and how, how long have you worked with him? Um, okay, so I, I was maybe half a year into my channel uh, and I just sent him out a tweet being that annoying Twitter user, which, I, please undo this, you know, but I did it, where I basically just sent him a message saying, hey, Larry, look at my video. I hope you like it. And he did. Like, what a quality guy, you know, massive YouTuber. Still took the time out to look at little old 1,000 subscriber me, you know, my video. Uh, he did. And then he's like, oh, I really wanted to do this myself because Larry's a guy that's got a million and one ideas and, you know, just not enough man hours to do them. Um, And uh, as time went on, he gave me advice on changing some of my stories. So instead of calling it the Sandy White trilogy, it was something like the first ever survival horror game it was a lot more interesting video for people to click on he gave me a lot of advice in my early days and um as time went on he really liked my video editing style and he said did you want to you know put a video on my channel and i said yes i do you know (laughs) i did and it absolutely i got thousands of subscribers that first time i ever did that and he really propelled me up and then as time went on i eventually started working for him and 
over the last year, maybe two years, if you look at his videos, a heavy, heavy chunk of them are edited by myself. Um, I, I, I writ a couple of them, and, and there's people like Kim Justice that writes and edits for him as well, and uh, another guy called Kieran who does uh, um, some writing for him as well. And it's just it's grown into a, a brilliant relationship. Like me and Larry chat most nights <laughs> about games and, and video ideas and you know podcast ideas and you know yeah so yeah me and Larry a uh, yeah, very close relationship I th- do you think retro gaming's in a, a good place at the moment then uh yes yes except for collectors because it's way too expensive <laughs> um yeah I think it's in a good place uh it's always worrying like what's my next subject going to be because there's so many people on youtube and so many retro gamers you know gaming channels covering this sort of stuff um but yeah i think it's in a good place what's your kind of collection like then have you um have you kind of increased your collection as you've been doing youtube are you buying more <laughs> systems and games and stuff i am buying a lot of random stuff like my wife's getting angry with me when she she when the package comes through the post i'm like can you open it up and it turns out to me maracas for a dreamcast game you know, like, <laughs> what are these um uh yeah it's growing but sadly i did sell a heavy amount of my collection during that dj gray period and it is ah oh, sickening absolutely sickening i wish i could get it back you know selling those games for a pound each and now they're like some of them are hundreds you know um i i, I have a i have a modest game collection i think to the average person i have a very big game collection but compared to some of the people you see when they're standing in front of their big game collection talking to the camera is nothing compared nothing compared I think you made an interesting point there about the fact that, you know, we kind of didn't know how valuable this stuff was going to be. I mean, you know, mm. you mentioned about the DJing stuff. I remember a friend of mine, because we were all into DJing and that we were at school. And I think his mum got him like a new, um, I think it was a Mega Drive, actually. Only had mm-hmm. it in about two weeks and he swapped it for like, a new Mark Belt Drive turntable and his mum went ape. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. In fact, it wasn't, it, it wasn't DJing this one, but the biggest mistake of my life, the biggest mistake of my life was that retro game shop. Uh, I, I sold my entire Mega Drive collection my youth i sold my youth for a pound a pop to buy a third and fourth dreamcast controller um oh absolutely sickening so they were like 20 something pounds each or something like that and then <laughs> i sold like 40 odd games and today they're quite cheap as well they're bizarre no, they're yeah. already about 15 oh, quid aren't they it's <laughs> sickening i bought a fourth controller like six months ago or so for two pounds yeah <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of buying old stuff, I mean, you are going to be at a place where there is uh, lots of retro gaming traders, and uh, Larry will oh, be yes. there as well. I mean, you are going to be joining us at Play Expo in Blackpool on the panel. I mean, um, you said you haven't been to a retro gaming show for a while. Are you, are you excited? For a long, long time, yeah. Uh, children have got in the way, uh, but I'm looking forward to, to jumping back on it, without a doubt. Yeah, we're going to be there. Uh, you're going to be spending the weekend in Blackpool? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. A few drinks at the bar then, no doubt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've been tweeting out about it, and so many people are like, oh, well, I'll have to meet up for a drink. If I have to meet up for a drink with every single person that says you want to meet up and have a drink, I will be trolled before the <laughs> Q&A starts. That's, right? that's pretty much every night in Blackpool. <laughs> oh, I'm proper excited for it. It's going to be amazing. Well, Daniel, Mr. Slopes, we can't wait to see you there next month, and uh, if anyone's coming down as well, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll see you all there in Blackpool. Um, absolutely. Thank you for talking to us. If people want to find you on YouTube and they haven't come across you already, um, how do they find you? What do they type in? Yep, any, any of the uh, big search engines, Google, YouTube, Twitter, Patreon, Facebook, type in Slopes Game Room, and you will find me. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.